Good evening, Rowan. It's the 31st of October 2016 and it's about 10.30 and I'm making you an extra special video this week to wish you a happy Halloween because you'll probably be out sacrificing virgins, won't you? <laughs> but if not, you'll probably be quite lonely on your own, won't you? Because um, your old hag of a wife... <laughs> <laughs> will be out flying around on her broomstick, won't she, with all the other bitches. Sorry, I mean witches. <laughs>strange with your evil old hag of a wife isn't it because um the kind of communication that she said was all in my head well she was actually communicating in that way wasn't she in that radio program something understood so it's kind of like schrodinger's communication isn't it it's both happening and not happening at the same time <laughs> This is actually uh, the kind of world I inhabited in the Church of England where things were both happening and not happening at the same <laughs> point in time. So perhaps you can imagine, well you can't obviously because um, you've got no empathy but you deliberately engineered these things because you knew it would be very stressful and it's gaslighting um, a technique used by psychopaths to make their victims question their perception of reality and to try and make them rely on the psychopath for interpreting reality for them. So that's what you were trying to do. You were trying to drive me crazy, effectively, with all this gaslighting. <laughs> so, uh, as you've discovered, I'm actually very psychologically stable and I don't put up with any bullshit. <laughs> So there we were in your evil old hag of a wife's radio broadcast, Schrodinger's Communication, <laughs> which is both in my head and actually happening at the same time. <laughs> there are the stories that the heart tells in its own language echoing and connecting with the words we speak, but never entirely contained in those words. What a thrilling thought. I'll leave the last word to T.S. Eliot. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Oh, you guys went off oh, when you died. I felt it melting. Oh, what a world. Who could have thought a good little girl like you to destroy my beautiful wickedness? Oh. So, I thought we could continue this evening our little chat about the interview that you gave in South Africa on the 24th of October 2016. So, that's just a week ago. So I was talking yesterday, you were talking about orthodoxy being about conversation and about keeping as many options open as possible. <laughs> or something to that effect anyway. Uh, so you're back on the subject of empathy this evening. The interviewer asks you about this. Um, he asks you to um, go over a point that you'd given in a lecture, that you had quite an unusual take um, on some aspect of empathy. Um, so here's what you say. My main point was that sometimes we're tempted to use the word empathy as a bit of a shortcut ethically, as if all we really needed to do was understand the other and then all the problems would dissolve. Um, well, I think you think that all you have to do is understand the other and all the problems will dissolve um, because when you understand the other person normally you've worked out how to 
manipulate them and to get what you want or how to ruin them if they won't give you what you want um and so you've probably come to the conclusion now that understanding another person doesn't necessarily get you what you want um because that's your ultimate goal really isn't it and you just see other people as either giving or withholding um the things that you want or think that you need <laughs> Because you think the universe revolves around you. <laughs> so, um, you need to understand that I'm not giving you what you want. So, if you understand that I'm not giving you what you want, that doesn't mean that your problems are going to dissolve, does it? Because I'm not giving you what you want. <laughs> and for you, that's a really big problem. <laughs> An existential problem, in fact, because... Um, kind of suggests that the universe isn't really revolving around you after all or at least not all of it anyway you go on to say or all we really needed to do was put ourselves in another's shoes and then we'd see what they felt like and we'd understand and that would be all right um well you're certainly not putting yourself in my beloved shoes <laughs> And it's not like you measure up anyway, is it? <laughs> it would only make you feel inadequate, wouldn't it? So uh, what would be the point of that? And I wouldn't be impressed because I know you're a fraud anyway. And uh, I'm saving myself for him because he's so wonderful and we're made for each other. <laughs> so uh, don't really think about putting yourself in his shoes, you see, because... Um, you're not getting any, and he is. So there you are. That's my decision on the matter. <laughs> so you then say, my objection is, well, I have a lot of objections, but I'll start with two. One is, I will never literally occupy the place of another, and it's a great mistake to suppose, to suppose I can, because when I imagine myself in the place of another, I imagine myself there. Uh, well, this is true, Rowan. This is why you're convinced that I'm going to capitulate. The next thing is going to be the thing uh, that makes me capitulate. And you're very confused um, when I don't act in the way that you predict because you don't understand that I'm not you. And I'm also not a lot of other people who would give in a lot more easily as well. Um, so, as I've said, I'm not your mother and so I won't be giving you what you want you i don't think you've quite figured that out yet um judging by some of the things you say a bit later on which i shall be coming on to um so when you imagine uh yourself in my place you can't understand why i don't just give you what you want you see it's all so logical to you you see because uh you think oh well you know she could have all this or all that if only um she'd give me what i want but you see for me that just isn't a price worth paying because uh, what i have is um more than anything that you could possibly give me and the things that i want are not under your control anyway so you're completely irrelevant to me uh, which i keep saying and i'm only making videos uh, because i'm mightily pissed off um, that i'm having all this crap forced on me and it's all because of you and um <laughs> I shan't be sparing you a second thought the moment you're in prison or even if you decide to kill yourself to try and tear me up with grief and regret for the rest of my life. Um, I shan't be sparing you a second thought whether you're alive or dead so that'll be a waste of time as I've said before. Um, so um, you imagine yourself in my place and you simply can't understand why I'm not acting in the way that you would. Um, and that's because I'm not a cheap whore like you, you see. <laughs> you think that everybody's like you, um, but you're actually in a very small minority of the population with your extreme narcissism and uh, psychopathic traits, shall we say. Uh, it's not that other people don't have them, <laughs> but they don't have them to the extreme that you've got them. You're a very extreme example. So you then say, and that can mean I appropriate their experience 
I draw it to myself. I think that's what you said. Um, the sound's not very good. I turn it to another form of self-regard. Um, well, you do feed off other people and their loss is your gain. And you like it uh, when you're the centre of attention and other people are telling you that you're wonderful. And you've learnt that being self-deprecating in the things that you say go down well in um, a Christian community. So this is um, the way that you've learnt to manipulate um, people in churches. <laughs> Even though you're extremely narcissistic, proud and arrogant, um, you convey um, yourself. The things that you say anyway at the beginning of lectures and if people praise you are self-deprecating, um, but you know um, that that's considered to be a virtue in Christian circles to some degree. So this is why you do it, to give the impression that you're very humble when in fact you're exceptionally arrogant. So you then say, so that won't quite do. So the idea that simply knowing another's point of view dissolves the difference, that's quite dangerous. Um, you do use words like dangerous and toxic um, in a quite, quite a melodramatic way, really. I'm not sure that not having empathy or misunderstanding someone else's dangerous it's a bit too strong a word to be using there um, although it might be quite dangerous for you because um, you have seriously misjudged me i i think you've misjudged other people as well um, because you're so narcissistic and you think you're more intelligent than other people you never thought that anyone would be able to catch you out or figure out how to um catch you out so you've hoisted your own petard um, in many ways one of which is um, putting me in this situation as i've said before uh, where i've had lots of time to be researching your shady activities and then of course you see because i couldn't be ordained in the uh, anglican church because of all the problems that you caused that meant i had to get another job so i went and worked in mental health which made me competent to assess people's mental state uh, because of the training and experience i had through that so it that helped me to pick up on your character traits and your behavior patterns and the fact that you can't understand metaphor and this kind of thing and also uh, because i didn't like one of the jobs that i had in mental health very much i also trained to be a health and safety trainer um, so that meant that i knew within half an hour of realizing that 9-11 was an inside job I knew within half an hour of realizing that that you were definitely lying about it because you said um, that you were the group of people in an office building in Manhattan the financial district of New York and um, you found some masks and most of you put them on and I knew that was a ludicrous story uh, because of the training that I'd had in health and safety and in fact I've got 70% of the competence of a health and safety assessor um, from the health and safety executive which is a British government agency responsible for um, implementing and um, advising on health and safety at work in Britain um, so you hoisted your own petard in that way as well because as soon as I realised 9-11 was an inside job I remembered that you said you'd been there and I knew straight away that you had something to do with it so I looked on the internet I found these two videos of you talking about it straight away and literally within half an hour of realizing it was an inside job I knew without a shadow of a doubt that you were lying about it and that was because I'd done health and safety training um, because I wasn't able to be ordained in the Anglican Church and that was because of the problems that you caused me um, so you hoisted your own petard <laughs> It's because you're just so arrogant. You never see that things may unfold in a way that you haven't planned. You just live from moment to moment. And to you, you're the novelist. You're at the centre of it all. And you're creating the narrative. And you're uh, creating the characters in the novel. 
um, into being and you really don't understand that uh, people have an identity separate from you, other people, and the, that you're not, in fact, at the centre of the universe. It's very confusing with you. You have expressed this confusion um, as well, which is on a couple of videos on YouTube as well, which um, I think I've mentioned before. So you then say, so what I was arguing was real empathy was understanding that I can't understand the other. Um, well, that isn't empathy at all, really. I mean, to some degree, nobody uh, can completely understand another person because people are distinct individuals. Uh, but the thing with empathy is that you can feel for another person. Um, and as I've said, you can't do that because you don't even understand that other people are distinct from you. And because your manner of thinking is so vastly different from the majority of people, um, it's hard to see how you could even develop empathy. Um, what you've got is keen observational skills and an almost scientific method of checking people out um, to find out what their weak spots are and what motivates them um, so you can better find out how to manipulate and destroy them. Um, and I can see that that's what you've done to me over the years. And um, I'm also aware of a, some other individuals that you've you've acted in the same way and deliberately created um, difficult situations into being the most damaging thing that they could possibly be. Um, so you set, talk about understanding that the other has a reality, a sort of density of their own, a sort of three dimensionality. So I think by talking in these um, kind of spatial terms about other people it's quite obvious that you don't really understand other people because um, an ordinary person wouldn't talk about other people in this kind of way really um, a sort of density of their own a sort of three-dimensionality um, why would a person describe another human being like that? It's like you're trying to give the impression that you do really understand other people and that they're different from you, um, but you're just making it more obvious that you don't. And you say, and because of that, I won't exhaust it in my imaginative efforts. Uh, well, no, you won't. Not with your um, minuscule floppy thing, will you? <laughs> <laughs> you certainly won't be uh, exhausting me anyway because uh, I wouldn't piss on you if you were on fire and in any case I'm saving myself for my beloved because he's so wonderful and we made for each other and he's really sexy and just fantastic and nothing like you at all so you then say but the imagination comes in the time I spend listening, absorbing, putting together what the other communicates with me. Oh, so I am communicating with you then. This is uh, phase two of Schrodinger's communication, which is both happening and not happening at the same point in time. <laughs> so that I can continue the conversation. This isn't the purpose um, of me communicating with you. I don't want a conversation with you at all. It's just that you keep talking so much shit and I'm really sick of it. And I'm not letting you get away with anything. Um, and um, as soon as you're out of the picture, I won't be sparing you a second thought. Um, and you say, I can continue the learning process. Um, well, you can't really, can you? Because you're a psychopath and you can't learn and you keep doing the same things over and over again. And now you're trying to seem more amiable because um, threatening to kill me <laughs> hasn't worked. And you've realised that uh, I think that people who threaten to kill me are absolute scumbags and I don't want anything to do with them. So you're now trying a more uh, amiable invitational conversational approach that um, this is a, a conversation and not a lecture which is what the interviewer says at the end so you then say and whether we're talking about the relation between individuals or between communities or ethnic groups or whatever I think the same applies 
I think that's just a bit of additional waffle there. And then you say the fatal thing is when, for example, I as a man say to a woman, I understand your position or I feel your pain. There's a level at which I might, if I'm intelligent and sympathetic enough, I might be able to say some of that. But I would say, beware, there'll always be something you haven't discovered. There'll always be more you'll have to learn. And you have to recognise that the mysteriousness of the other is one of the ways in which you meet God in the situation. Um, well, you don't believe in God, Rowan, do you? <laughs> <laughs> the fatal thing this is like the dangerous thing the thing that's quite dangerous uh, that you said earlier I don't think you're threatening to kill me in this one uh, although you might be but you're trying to seem amiable so I don't think uh, that you're threatening to kill me <laughs> in this statement <laughs> I understand your position or I feel your pain uh, I don't think I'm going to comment on this now because it's related to something that you say later on. Um, there's a level at which I might, if I'm intelligent and sympathetic enough, I might be able to say some of that. Well, you're neither intelligent nor sympathetic. I'm not talking about academic intelligence, uh, even though you're an academic fraud. It's not that you have no level of intelligence that way, but you've got no emotional and psychological intelligence. You're chronically immature um, and you're not in the least sympathetic. All you want from other people is that they give you what you want um, and you don't care about them. You just pick people up and you throw them away uh, when they're not of any use to you anymore. Um, The only thing you need to discover about me, uh, which I've told you about 50 times now, is that I'm never having anything to do with you. Uh, so you're not meeting God in any situation with me, um, except I'm telling you that you need to turn to Christ and repent of your sins if you want to inherit eternal life uh, rather than spend eternity in hell. Although I suppose you'll have your evil old hag of a wife to keep you company the way she's going as well. Anyway, then the interviewer prompts you with another question and uh, you say that uh, the word accompaniment is one that I come back to again and again here. We talk rather loosely perhaps about identifying with the other. We might more practically think about accompanying the other. I always do say to people, walk together, not because it's such an enriching and exciting experience for me, but because our well-being is bound up together. I don't know whether you're on S&M there. I can't remember how you said it. <laughs> I don't think you were because it didn't strike me at the time. But uh, our well-being, if you're talking about me and you, Rowan, of which there is no me and you, and in any case I'm saving myself for my beloved because he's so wonderful and we're made for each other. <laughs> and then there is his enormous feet as well, which uh, is uh, quite a helpful thought. <laughs> <laughs> in keeping me focused uh, so our well-being is not bound up together there is no hour and uh, there is no together it's all in your head you're living in la la land <laughs> um so this is where you're talking about earlier on which i said i was going to come on to later on um that you understand understood the position that someone was in or um, you couldn't say as a man that you to a woman that you understood the position she was in or that you feel her pain um, but uh, you're talking about accompanying someone well um, I really don't want a psychopath accompanying me in fact you've been accompanying me around the world and causing me problems everywhere so I think I've had quite enough accompanying um, and our well-being is not bound up together you've simply tried to make it so because you can't take no for an answer because of your extreme narcissism um, and as I said that all the problems that you caused me were to help me as you saw it to make the right choice um, 
my having made the wrong choice back in 1994 when I refused to have sex with you. Um, in fact, I just pretended I hadn't noticed that you were propositioning me and I left straight away. Um, so you say, in keeping company, we discover what we might be to one another. I think that's a bit creepy. So we're not keeping company, Rowan, and we're not going to be anything to one another. It's all in your head. Stop fantasising about it. It's not happening. The moment you're out of the picture, I shan't be sparing you a second thought. And in any case, I'm going to be with my lover straight away um, because he's so wonderful and we're made for each other. So... Then you say, and I think that's a practical, ethical goal that we should be working at. Identification can so easily become about sentimentality, and I think we have to pull back from that. <laughs> so I just think this is a lot of flannel. You're trying to make out that you've got this um profound insight into people and into pastoral situations and so on which i've said before and it's just you're just shooting in the dark all the time to try and see what's going to get you the outcome um, that you want and i think you do you, well you certainly do this in all your relationships as well um, those that you haven't figured out yet i mean um, so <laughs> Your ethical goal needs to be about keeping basic morality, uh, like, for example, not lying all the time. That would be a good place to start. Stop lying all the time and forget about identifying with other people and all this kind of thing because you've simply not grown up enough. Um, just stick to keeping the rules. <laughs> <laughs> and don't make the rules up yourself either just stick to keeping the rules and the first rule that you should be thinking about sticking to is to stop lying all the time you lie incessantly i don't even think that you know what the truth is to be honest so um try and imagine that reality is something that's actually there um and you're in a position where you need to be interpreting reality and uh, telling the truth about it rather than just making crap up in your head and trying to force everything around you and everyone around you to conform to your fantasies um, which is the way that you operate um, so i'm guessing you don't even understand what i'm talking about because you are still just trying to push the buttons to get the outcome that you want because i've told you emphatically about fifty thousand times i'm never having anything to do with you i don't want anything to do with you <laughs> and uh, that's the end of the story rowan and uh, it's no good you giving speeches at the royal society of literature which i made a video about this saying the issue isn't decided yet um, and this kind of thing uh, because the issue is decided you see Rowan because I've decided that I don't wish to have anything to do with you I've decided and that's how it is um, so take it or leave it I don't care because I shan't be sparing you a second thought the moment I'm free to be with my lover because um, we'll be so busy together loved up and in each other's arms <laughs> I'll try and remember to send you a photo. Anyway, I shall leave it there for this evening because I've been waffling on for quite a long time now. Uh, but don't forget to be alert because uh, I will be turning up to make a citizen's arrest because you are a terrorist according to UK law. Um, and uh, obviously I want to be going to sleep as soon as possible so I can be dreaming about my wonderful, handsome, gorgeous future lover. And I want to be dreaming about him all night long. Hasta la próxima. Christians. But you raised a, a, a very, very challenging point, something around which I'm going to have to think a great deal, um, which is a particular view of empathy. I wonder if you can say a little more about the, the sort of kernel of the contribution you made today around empathy. My main point was that sometimes we're tempted to use the word empathy as a bit of a shortcut, yeah. ethically, as if all we really needed to do was understand the other, mm. and then all the problems would dissolve. Mm. Or, 
all we really needed to do was put ourselves in another's shoes, and then we'd see what they felt like and we'd understand them and then we'd write it. Hmm. My objection is, well, I have a lot of objections, but that's stop at two. Hmm. One is, from the latter point, I will never literally occupy the place of another. Hmm. And it's a great mistake to suppose I can, because when I imagine myself in the place of another, I imagine myself there. Hmm. And that can mean I sort of appropriate their experience, I draw it to myself, mm. I turn it to another form of self-regard. Mm. So that would quite do. And also, the idea that simply knowing another's point of view dissolves the difference. Mm. And that's quite dangerous. So what I was arguing was, real empathy is understanding that I can't understand the other. Mm. Understand that the other has a reality, a sort of density of their own, mm. a real sort of three-dimensionality. And because of that, I won't exhaust it in my imaginative efforts. But the imagination comes in, in the time I spend listening, absorbing, putting together what the other communicates with me, so that I can, I can continue the conversation, I can continue the learning process. Mm. And whether we're talking about the relation between individuals or between communities or ethnic groups or whatever, I think the same applies. Mm. The fatal thing is when, for example, I as a man say to a woman, oh, I understand your position, mm. or I feel your pain, mm. or when I as a white person say to a black person, of course I understand where you're coming from. Mm. There's a level at which I might, if I'm intelligent and sympathetic enough, I might be able to say some of that, but I would say beware. There will always be something you haven't mm. discovered. There will always be more you have to learn. And you have to recognize that the mysteriousness of the other is one of the ways in which you mean God in this mm. situation. Mm. Now, I've also heard uh, some echoes in what you were saying about this uh, fundamental Christian commitment to deep solidarity, even in the midst of that mystery. So, I have a sense that you, you, you spoke uh, about this notion that we almost turn empathy into a utility. Yes. And uh, I have a sense that part of what we are needing to recapture, that what I'm needing to recapture in my own Christian walk, is patience, deep solidarity, and a commitment that says, I'll journey with you, not because I may achieve anything that's good for me, but simply because we are bound to one another. Yes. The word accompaniment is one that I come back to again and again here, but we perhaps talk rather loosely sometimes about identifying the other, and what we might more practically think is how we accompany one another. How as you say do we walk together? Mm. Not because it's such an enriching and exciting experience for me, but because our well being is bound up together. In keeping company we discover what, what we might be to one another. Mm. Mm. And that's, I think that's a, a practical, ethical goal that we should, we should be working at. Identification can so easily become a kind of sentimentality. Mm. And I think we have to pull that from that. Yeah, absolutely. Rowan, uh, you've had a very, very busy day, and I know you still have something ahead. So uh, I really want to say thanks so much for you. uh, your time to uh, spend a bit of time with. Uh, us on camera and uh, great treat to be with you. <laughs> great. So remember, it's not a lecture, just a thought. And uh, I'll post in the show notes uh, a number of links uh, to the work of Dr. Williams. So thanks for watching, and uh, we hope to be with you again soon. Great.
why Catholics have the best sex. <laughs> <laughs>